This is Revelation chapter 10, and we're going to find out who the mighty angel is. I believe the mighty angel is the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm going to list reasons why I believe this is so. I want to say this is what I believe the verses teach. You don't have to believe it. I don't think it's a fundamental to the faith or anything. But number one, I believe this angel is the Lord Jesus Christ is because he is clothed with a cloud. Revelation 10, 1 says, And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face were as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. So the mighty angel comes down from heaven, and what a frightening scene to the people on earth. It says he is clothed with a cloud. This is the same as the Lord Jesus Christ when he ascends and descends from heaven. In Acts 1, 9, when he went up, a cloud received him out of their sight. In Revelation 1, 7, it describes Jesus Christ when he comes back at the second advent, and it says, Behold, he cometh with clouds. So the first reason I believe this is Jesus Christ is because he is clothed with a cloud. Moving on, the second reason is because this angel has a rainbow about his head. In verse 1 in Revelation 10, it says a rainbow was upon the angel's head. And when Ezekiel saw the visions of God and the cherubim in Ezekiel 1, 27 through 28, it says it was as the appearance of a bow. And God has a bow, a rainbow, round about the throne as we saw in chapter 4. The rainbow upon the head could be where people have got the idea for a halo. And this rainbow has been taken for a symbol of sex perversion, but the rainbow is really God's symbol. Satan loves to blaspheme by trying to turn the things of God into something called an abomination. Not only this, but verse 1 of Revelation 10 also says his face were as it were the sun. And that is the third reason I believe this is Jesus Christ. Revelation 1.16 says, And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Malachi 4.2 calls him the son of righteousness. And next we see another thing in common. The fourth reason, I believe this is the Lord Jesus Christ, is because it says in verse 1 of chapter 10, His feet are as pillars of fire. So the angel, his feet are as pillars of fire. And then back in Revelation 1.15, talking about Jesus Christ, it says, His feet are like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace. So you can see just in the first verse there are many things in common between this mighty angel and between the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is a pre-second coming appearance of Jesus Christ. Moving on to verse 2 we read in Revelation 10.2. It says, And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth. I'm not sure what this little book is. Someone joking said maybe it is a Gideon's New Testament. But he has in his hand a little book opened. And who is it that is opening all these books in the book of Revelation? That would be the Lord Jesus Christ. In Revelation 5, 9, he is the only one worthy to open the book. At the great white throne, he will open the books there. It isn't a stretch to believe that he is the one with an open book here. He is a bookkeeper. He is a reader. He constantly asked the Pharisees, Have ye not read? He gave attendance to reading when he was here. And he has everything you have ever done written in a book. Moving on to verse 3, we see another thing in common. It says in Revelation 10.3, And cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. He cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. This is number five why I believe Jesus Christ is the mighty angel. Jesus is, is referred to as the lion of the tribe of Judah in Revelation 5 and verse 5. The Bible talks about the voice of God literally roaring. In Isaiah 42, 13, it says, The Lord shall go forth as a mighty man, and he shall stir up jealousy like a man of war. He shall cry, yea, roar, he shall prevail against his enemies. It does does the same thing in Jeremiah 25:30. And then moving on to verse 4 of Revelation chapter 10, we see another resemblance. In Revelation 10:4, it says, "And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, 
And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders have uttered, and write them not. These seven thunders are connected to God on his throne. So the number six reason why the mighty angel is Jesus Christ is because they are both associated with seven thunders. In the Bible, thunder is associated with the voice of God. In Psalms 29.3 it says, The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thundereth. The Lord is upon many waters. Revelation 4.5 And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Also notice that in Revelation 10.4 that John is told to seal up the things and write them not. For whatever reason, God chose not to reveal those things yet. And this goes to show many times in our Christian life, we may not be ready for something. The best thing to do is wait on the Lord. In Daniel chapter 12, Daniel was told the same thing. He was told to shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. When the apostle Paul was caught up to heaven, God told him not to tell what he saw. And I'm glad there are some things that haven't been revealed. That way God can reveal things to us throughout eternity. The Bible truly is a never-ending story. And the never-ending story movies were just counterfeits. The Bible is the true never-ending story. Revelation 10, 5 and 6 says, And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. Notice that this mighty angel is no evolutionist. He believes Genesis 1-1, that God created the earth and everything in it. He is lifting up his hand toward heaven and making an oath with the God who made everything. Revelation 10-7 says, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he declared to his servants the prophets. The mystery of God is found in 1 Timothy 3-16 which says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. At the second coming, Jesus Christ is going to be revealed right in front of everyone's faces for everyone to see. And every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him. And at this time, the mystery of God shall be finished. Moving on to verse 8, we find another reason the angel is Jesus Christ. Revelation 10, 8. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. Notice you have another example of God the Father talking from heaven while the Son is on the earth. Compare this to Mark one eleven, where you had Jesus Christ being baptized by John and the Father up in heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Mark one eleven says, And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Same thing happens here in Revelation 10. A voice from heaven speaks while the Son is on earth. Revelation 10:8 and 9, it says, And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again, and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. This goes to show that the word of God is to be eaten up. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God shall man live. Jeremiah fifteen sixteen says, Thy words were found, and I did eat them, and thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. The word of God is even compared to food. Hebrews five thirteen and 14 says, For every one that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those by who, who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Notice that John asked the mighty angel for the little book. 
I believe if you come to Jesus Christ with a sincere believing heart and ask him to open the Bible for you, then he will. And God wants someone who isn't going to correct his words. He wants someone who will approach the Bible with the attitude of they are the ones who need correction and not his preserved words found in the King James Bible. Those aren't what needs correction. We're the one that needs correction. Revelation 10 and verse 10. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. The Bible can leave you with the best feeling in the world. If you are in sin, it can leave you with the worst feeling in the world. It can be sweet and it can be bitter. Psalms 19, 8 and through 10 says, The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired than any gold, or more to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. So it's sweet. Also look at what Ezekiel was told to do in Ezekiel 2, 8 through 10, and then Ezekiel 3, 1 through 3. It says, But thou son of man, hear what I say unto thee. Be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house. Open thy mouth, and eat that I give thee. And when I looked, behold, an hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein, and he spread it before me, and it was written within and without, and there was written therein lamentation, mourning, and woe. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, eat that thou findest, eat this roll, and go speak unto the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat that roll. And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat, and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then did I eat, and it was my it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. So the same thing kind of happens to Ezekiel. And once again, the word of God is sweet. Back to Revelation chapter 10 and verse 11. It says, And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. And this verse implies, seems to imply that John could possibly be coming back in the time of Jacob's trouble. And you're going to, Stop and say, well, that's crazy. And that's because that's something that you've possibly never heard before. But this isn't so crazy when you realize that you yourself believe Moses and Elijah are coming back. And the people who don't believe that believe Enoch and Elijah are coming back. So you believe that somebody is coming back that was here before. I mean, you believe Jesus Christ is coming back. Sometimes people need to understand that just because they have never heard anything before doesn't mean it isn't true. I believe this comes from pride and a person almost thinking they know it all. But God continues to show things to me about his word simply by reading it and listening to others that read it. Uh, it's weird when somebody says, I believe the exact same things that I believed when I first got saved. I believe completely different than I did when I first got saved. When you first got saved, you don't know what the Bible says. And all you know is what somebody's told you. And then you get in the Bible for yourself and you read it and you see that stuff you believed just doesn't line up with what it says. And then you change your beliefs to fit the Bible. And then on the, along the way, if you're faithful to the words and you're reading it, then God will show you things that he hadn't showed you yet. So you're constantly learning you're going to be changing a little bit of your beliefs here and there if you're honest. I mean, I'm not talking about you're going to be going from a, from believing everyone has free will to being a Calvinist and then being a dispensationalist to being a non-dispensationalist. I'm not talking about constant drastic changes. I'm talking about like little changes here and there where you're shown truth. I'm not talking about being tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine where you're something this week and then you're something that week and you just keep changing back and forth. I'm talking about there's some things that you believe that weren't true because of a tradition you believed and then you read the Bible and you choose the Bible over that tradition of your denomination. Things like that. But look at Matthew chapter 10 
verses 22 and 23. It says, And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another. For verily I say unto you, Ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. So Jesus Christ here tells the disciples, Ye shall have not gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. Once again implying the disciples are coming back because Jesus Christ hasn't come back yet. When John comes back and prophesies, he's going to do it in front of many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. And this seems to imply he will have the gift of tongues. As you know, if you have listened to me for a while, I believe the present day tongue speaking is devilish nonsense. Tongues isn't for today. It's not biblical and no tongue speaker today follows the guidelines for tongues. But in the time of Jacob's trouble, God will switch back to dealing primarily with the Jews and the sign gifts come back. The speaking in tongues, the healing, the being able to drink any poison, being able to pick up any deadly thing and be bit by it and it won't hurt them. All them gifts that God gave to the apostles, they come back in the time of Jacob's trouble because who is time of Jacob's trouble for? The Jew. That's why it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. Who requires a sign? The Jew. And the people are going to have these sign gifts again to convince unbelieving Jews. But if you're saved, you're not going to have to go through that future time period. But it's fun to learn about the book of Revelation. And the Bible says, if we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we can be saved. And Paul gives us the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So Jesus Christ died. He died by shedding his blood. Jesus Christ died for your sins. He was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. To be saved, you come to Jesus Christ as the guilty sinner that you are. Quit relying on your own good deeds to get you to heaven because you don't have anything good enough about you that can make it to heaven. Your sins are going to take you to hell and until you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're on a path to hell fire. We aren't saved by good works, meaning we're not saved by the good things we do. There is no good works that can save us. Jesus did all the work on the cross. And if we come to Jesus Christ and put our trust on what he did on the cross to save us, then we can be saved and have eternal life. I'm not relying on my own self to get me to heaven. I'm relying on the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we do this, then we can be saved and have eternal life. So I hope you do this before it's entirely too late and one day you wake up in eternal hell.